Obstructive sleep apnea affects between 25 to 50 percent of men and it's something that happens more as we get older. In terms of females, it affects women more post-menopause. And obstructive sleep apnea is characterized by collapse of the upper airway during sleep. So for example, the soft palate can fall into the throat or the tongue falls into the throat or the epiglottis or we have collapse of the throat itself. It's quite a complex condition and it's not solely down to the anatomy of the upper airway. Traditionally, obstructive sleep apnea was taught that the problem is that the airway is too narrow. And with such a narrow airway, the throat was more predisposed to collapsing during sleep. If it's a partial collapse and it causes blood oxygen saturation to drop by about 3 to 4%, that can be termed a hypopnea. And if it's a total collapse of the airway, that our breathing stops altogether and it lasts for more than 10 seconds, that's called an apnea. What's added up is the number of hypopneas and apneas that you have throughout your sleep divided by the number of hours of your sleep and that gives you what's called the apnea hypopnea index. If you're mild sleep apnea as an adult, you have between 5 and 15 events per hour. If you're moderate, it's between 15 to 30 and if you're severe, it's 30 plus events per hour. How can breathing re-education and the buteco method to help with obstructive sleep apnea? Well, if we look at the change in the field of sleep apnea since about 2013, there's a recognition that one of the characteristics of obstructive sleep apnea is anatomical. That's called peak crit. And peak crit is the pressure at which the airway collapses. You don't want your airway collapsing at a low suction pressure because there of course you're going to have a more severe obstructive sleep apnea. How can we influence peak crit? Well if we're breathing through the nose with good recruitment of the diaphragm, nose breathing helps to open up the airway and also with nose breathing we're more likely to have correct tongue resting posture but we also have to train the tongue to be resting in the roof of the mouth. So we should wake up with our tongue resting in the roof of the mouth with our lips together that automatically will help to open the diameter of the airway to make the diameter of the airway wider. So in turn, it reduces the negative pressure, which in turn is going to reduce the risk of having obstructive sleep apnea. Another factor is that when we are breathing nose, we also want to have good recruitment of the diaphragm. Because when we breathe with good recruitment of the diaphragm, it in turn increases lung volume. And when there's an increase in lung volume, the throat is stiffer and less likely to collapse. So think about nose and low to help with the anatomy of the airway. The second characteristic of obstructive sleep apnea is loop gain. And loop gain refers to the stability of your breathing during sleep. Individuals with high loop gain have unstable breathing during sleep. They stop breathing during sleep due to collapse of the airway, but when they resume breathing, they resume breathing with such exaggerated ventilation and this in turn then is feeding into further apneas, both central and also obstructive. How might you recognize high loop gain? You can recognize it by the length of your breath hold time measured during wakefulness. If you have a low breath hold time during wakefulness, that indicates that you've got high loop gain during sleep, that your breathing is unstable. And what's important with high loop gain is to remember that anatomical interventions don't help with high loop gain. So for example, mandibular advancement devices don't help individuals with high loop gain. Surgery doesn't help individuals with high loop gain. And 30% of the sleep apnea population have high loop gain. So how do you help lower high loop gain? You practice the buteco method. You practice breathing light, breathing slow, breathing low to reduce the chemosensitivity of the body to carbon dioxide. Because with a reduced chemosensitivity of the body to carbon dioxide, breath hold time during wakefulness is higher, but high loop gain is reducing. So we can directly target high loop gain by practicing the buteco method. And the buteco method is ideally positioned with the tools to help address high loop gain. It's very important during sleep apnea that the treatment options are tailored according to the characteristics or phenotypes of sleep apnea that's present in that person. So we talked already about peak crit, we can have lower high peak crit, 
but we can also help lower Hyloop gain. The third phenotype is arousal threshold, and arousal threshold refers to your propensity to wake from sleep. Are you a deep sleeper? In other words, if you're a really deep sleeper, you might stop breathing for 50 or 60 seconds before you're aroused from sleep. Or are you a light sleeper that you stop breathing for five or 10 seconds and that's enough to arouse you from sleep? So light sleepers would be individuals with what's called low arousal threshold. And we can help to improve the depth of quality of sleep by breathing through the nose, by breathing light, but also by practicing 10 to 15 minutes of breathing light before sleep. Always remember that it's our breathing during wakefulness that influences our breathing during sleep. So it's how you breathe during your normal every day. Are you breathing faster, harder, upper chest, mouth breathing? Because this will feed into poor breathing patterns during sleep and this in turn can increase the risk of sleep disorder breathing. So for people with low arousal thresholds, this will be characteristic of insomnia. And remember we said that insomnia is difficulty falling asleep. Insomnia affects about 30% of the population. 10% of people have chronic insomnia. And insomnia and obstructive sleep apnea often go together. And when insomnia and obstructive sleep apnea goes together, depression rate is higher. So depression can be more common with people who have both insomnia and obstructive sleep apnea than obstructive sleep apnea alone. The fourth phenotype of obstructive sleep apnea is upper airway recruitment. And this refers to whether the muscles in the throat, which are designed to maintain an open airway, if they are actually doing their job properly. How do we help to improve the recruitment of the muscles in the upper airway? One therapy that's tremendous is called myofunctional therapy. And if you were to reach out to the Academy of Orofacial Myofunctional Therapy, AOMT, Mark Moeller or Joy Moeller, and you will find myofunctional therapists throughout the world who can assist with improving the functioning of the tongue, correct swallowing, correct tongue resting posture, and also in terms of improving the functioning of the muscles in the throat to help maintain a more open airway. Breathing has some small role to play here because as you breathe through your nose, you harness nasal nitric oxide, and nitric oxide is an erocrine messenger. And also as your breathing is stable, when, you're, when your control pause is increasing. And also, when your control pause is increasing, your breathing during sleep is becoming more stable. And with more stable breathing, the output from the brain to the upper airway dilator muscles also improves. So all in all, we can help all four phenotypes of obstructive sleep apnea, especially high peak crit, high loop gain, and low arousal threshold, and to a lesser extent, upper airway muscle recruitment.